Whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life. Welcome to India. Today the journey continues. This is our third and last program in a special series to introduce you to this beautiful country and the involvement that Living Truth has in what God is doing in this nation. A year ago, we came to build ties with some of the people who minister here and put living truth on the air. Like never before, India is open to the gospel. Just this morning, I attended a church in Chennai where 20,000 people were meeting in one session. It was a remarkable thing to witness. And it's thrilling to know that here, living truth has a potential audience of 1.2 billion people, many of whom have never heard the good news of Jesus Christ. But as we come to this country and met many of its people, we realize there is much work to be done. Our task is to preach the gospel. We will continue to do that. But we also know that the gospel is a cup of cold water offered in the name of Jesus. Sometimes it's shelter offered in the name of Jesus. Sometimes it's education. This also is declaring the gospel. And I'm privileged to be part of a supportive ministry that not only understands this, but is making a commitment to doing something practical. You too are part of this. We're here because I believe the people of Canada who watch this program every week also want to be part of supporting and partnering with ministers that offer a cup of cold water to those who are thirsty. A cup of clean cold water is evidence of faith in action. Words alone can be cheap and meaningless. Our actions here show the Indian people the reality of what we're talking about. We want our efforts to start with those who are most in need. We want to invest in the lives of children with food, shelter, love, education, and planting in them the seeds of hope for the future and presenting them with the gospel of Jesus Christ. In Calcutta, we're partnering with Monique Shaw, who works with the young girls and women trapped in an industry that abuses and exploits them. I had the opportunity to visit with Monique as we walked through the streets of Calcutta just a few blocks away from the red light district she told me what life in India was like we talked about the women she'd come to know and how each one of them has a heartbreaking story how the women are enslaved to their brothel owners and how over three quarters of the pittance they earn ends up in the pockets of their pimps and managers it was a privilege to hear Monique share her heart and see firsthand where she and her team worked I've seen firsthand the sad and violent world that these women live in and most often they have been sold into brothels in their early teens. I wanted to have a place where these women could come in and just feel safe and so we started the coffee house, a little drop-in center where these women come in right away automatically. They sense that there's something different and they're drawn to come to this place. You just never know who's going to come in that door. And, you know, when we go into the coffee house, before anyone comes in, we just pray. We targeted 50 women to begin with and just have a one-on-one uh, -on -one relationship with them to get to know them better. And through that, more women are coming to the church. It's actually a really wonderful thing to see on Saturdays. It's awesome to just see these ladies excited to come to church and worship together and hear about the Lord. 
Stuart, her husband, helps rescue children who live in the train station, many of whom have never had a home of their own. Nice work, buddy. My own visit there was an eye-opening and a moving experience. I learned how easy it is to reach out to children who have so little and need so much. I quickly discovered how easy it was to make friends. My name is Charles. 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 Yeah, you got that, Charles? Good morning. Good morning. We communicated in the simplest ways, and I felt their love, and I hope they felt mine. I shared some cookies with them, and later had the opportunity to pray for another group. Thank you for each of these boys. You created them, and you love every one of them. Although they live here on the railway, and maybe feel they have no friends, you are their friend. Thank you for those who care for them, for Stuart and, and Rob, and others who, who come and spend time with them. And I pray, Lord, that through them you'll minister your love in a way that is so real and so deep. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 And the vision that Stuart and Monique have is to have a place, a home, where some of these children can be brought and they can be nurtured, they can be cared for, they can be loved, they can be provided with the opportunity of education, they can be given hope for the future instead of just struggle for survival for today and no prospect of a tomorrow that's any more exciting or beneficial than today. Last week we met Isaac and Tara Managaram of Freedom in Christ Ministries. They have a vision to rescue baby girls in order to eventually place them in Christian families. We want to have a home where there will be a personal touch with these children, that we would be able to nurture them. In many ways we would be their father and their mother. And that is why we think this home would be different from other orphanages. This is really the love of God in action. In the lives of Isaac and Tara, it started in their own home. And now God wants to multiply that love, and we have the great privilege of being a part of their story. And we've seen the images, and we've heard the statistics. One third of the world's poorest, most disadvantaged children are right here in India. And with a population of 1.2 billion and growing, India's children, especially those living on the streets, have little hope for a positive future. These children don't learn how to love and trust or receive a basic education. What will happen when they grow up and have their own children? The consequences will last for many years. The cycle of abandonment, abuse and poverty will continue to spiral downward, destroying life after life, generation after generation. We've also heard how Isaac and Tara want to change that. Rescuing a child can stop that cycle. I know that's what I want to do for as many of these children as I can. These children have no options for changing their futures alone. They're dependent on others who will come into their life and take the initiative to give them a life they could never have dreamt of. A life with care and love in a Christian environment. Can we collectively take this initiative? I invite you to partner with us in our commitment to Isaac and Tara in this exciting venture. I find it beautiful that the vision of building an orphanage comes from the response of Tara's heart to her own children. It blossomed from seeing the young lives she had taken into her own home and into her own heart. Sitara and Taran were created by God to be loved and to love. Lord Jesus, please be with the children as we are going to adopt them. Help them not to fall ill again. Help us to play with them nicely. I hope my brother gets along very well. In Jesus' name we pray, Amen. Amen. From time to time on the program today, you'll see the toll-free phone number on the screen. That number is your link to India. If the stories you hear or the people you meet touch your heart, you can call in. Your donations support the noble causes that we're presenting to you. You can call in to make a donation by credit card. You can log on to our website or send in a check to Living Truth, Post Office Box 6100, Station B, Toronto, 
Ontario, M2K2Z5. And of course, your gift is tax deductible. Today, we journey to a small rural village to meet children who have no hope of having an education and therefore a future. I wanted to be a nurse and take care of children. I had no hope of that to happen, but God provided my deepest desire to have an education. Thanks to Jay Kumar and Jay Pakian. We will discover how what we can do will be an investment in the advancement of the kingdom of God and in the future of this country. And finally, we would be remiss if we left India without learning about the plight of another formidable section of India's population that are being forgotten. They're being left behind in its quest for progress and opportunity. We have the Indian caste system, and the Dalits were the lowest of the low. These were people who were not treated as human. In the next hour, I hope you'll be encouraged and inspired. Stay with us. You're watching a special edition of Living Truth on location in India. Six years ago, 150 heads of state got together in New York City for what would become the largest gathering of world leaders in history. The purpose of the gathering was to recognize that even though globalization was benefiting millions of people, poverty and suffering was still devastating millions of others. In some cases, entire countries. They called it uneven development progress. And to help balance the scales, the United Nations Millennium Summit committed to eight development goals to be reached by the year 2015. One, eradicate extreme poverty and hunger. Two, achieve universal primary education. Three, promote gender equality and empower women. Four, reduce child mortality. Five, improve maternal health. Six, combat HIV AIDS, malaria, and other diseases. Seven, ensure environmental sustainability. Eight, develop a global partnership for development. Now those are very big and important goals. Only one was prioritized for urgent action by 2005, and that was to make primary and secondary education as available to girls as it currently is to boys. I think it's remarkable that after all the research and large and complex theories are done, world leaders decided that our hope for the future lies in taking care of the children. An investment in the education of girls is the key. Sociologists tell us the education of girls is an important catalyst for change in society and for the reduction of poverty. They know these girls will grow up to make a significant contribution to a country's long-term economic growth. It breaks the cycle of poverty for their own lives and the lives of their children. She'll pass on the benefits of education to her children, her community, and her country. The earth is our hope. It is a very, very big hope. It is the hope of all men and women. Just imagine where the world would be if every girl was given the power of knowledge. The education of girls prevents the loss of vast amounts of human potential. Ninety countries have already failed in their commitment to this first goal. Friends, we're here in India, not on a political mission, but with our own commitment to spread the love and message of Jesus Christ to a hurting world. Today we're going to be hearing about a man who's made a commitment to helping girls and boys get a good education. Unless you think doing something important for these most downtrodden means you need special skills, position or means, today's story will show you how God uses anyone who offers themselves to Him. Coming up, the journey that takes Donna to the children who captured her heart. I've always loved children. I could be working in the big city, but this area is my home. I want to be close to the people that sponsored me and I want to stay to help my own community and the children I love so much. This is my place. You're watching a special edition of Living True on location in India. 
Today we journey to the south of India, off the beaten track to Madurai, one of India's oldest cities. Madurai was established just 550 years after Jesus' birth. It was built around a temple with 1,000 carved pillars. This temple is a veritable work of art and destination for many pilgrims and tourists. We're on the way to the outskirts of the city where the landscape changes significantly with poverty and destitution escalating to tragic proportions. Our destination is the tiny village of Wanpuram. A place whose desolation, drought and famine are only matched by its crushing poverty and widespread unemployment. Van Param is just one of the thousands of tiny villages scattered across the arid province of Tamil Nadu. Maybe you're like me and wonder how helping someone in a village like this with barely a dozen houses and huts could ever really make a difference. This is the story of a missionary who was able to look beyond the bleakness of this desert-like place. Year after year, he preached right here each Sunday to a small, faithful group. Among them was a small boy who could easily have been written off as just another poverty-stricken child of an untouchable caste with no future. Instead, the missionary adopted Jayakumar and sponsored his education. <laughs> This is Jayakumar today. He and his wife Jayapakiam are doctors, as are their two sons. Their daughter hopes to begin her medical studies soon. Jayakumar and Jayapakiam have lived and studied abroad and could be teaching or practicing in many prestigious institutions or universities. Instead, they have returned here to make a difference in the lives of those most neglected, the Dalits or untouchables. I had finished Master of Social Work and Bachelor of Law, but my all, all the time spent for the downtrodden people. The caste system has been in place for thousands of years. Jay Want Michael, who works with an international ministry, knows most are virtually powerless to escape a life similar to slavery. We have the Indian caste system and the Dalits were the lowest of the low. These were people who were not treated as human and were expected to do things that no one else was willing to do. And because of that, they were socially unclean. There was no normal human interaction with the Dalits. It's been centuries of oppression building up. At the time of the Indian independence, it was recognized that this was a huge group of people that needed to get into the mainstream. And these were precisely the people Jayakumar most wanted to reach. But he knew that helping Dalits find true freedom, emotionally, spiritually, and practically, required making a continued investment over several generations, a task much larger than he could give. He decided to focus his vision on Dalit children. Jayakumar knew the profound challenges Dalit children faced, especially in being able to get even a basic education. Not many schools are actually available, and secondly, uh, because of just economic reasons, uh, the parents would rather put the children to work. The hope for the Dalits is definitely in education. We have many solutions that we can offer them, economic and other things, but those are mostly going to be short-lived. If Jayakumar could help provide education for Dalit children, he knew the benefits would impact generations to come. He remembered his own childhood, what it was like to look out on a future without hope or possibilities, and how education had opened his world. The UN has recognized education can really transform a family, a community, and society. And so uh, education, in many cases, is the starting point. Schooling could provide vocation, offering children who barely knew how to dream futures full of promise. Although Jayakumar had no money, he knew God's provision would match the vision he had given him. He started with the most disadvantaged of all, young girls. In a dusty field where only tumbleweed survived, the Matha School of Nursing was started to give rural Dalit girls the skills to become self-sufficient and to be able to serve their communities. As Jayakumar's vision grew, more and more schools were added. 
Now, 25 years later, Jayakumar has returned the sponsorship given him 100-fold. So Jayakumar and Mrs. Jayabakib are persons gifted from God. Uh, really, they are a person to be admired and taken to be a person as role models in our life. They have been so helpful and uh, I'm very thankful to both of them. This oasis of learning serves rural Dalit young men and women where neither caste nor social class make any difference. In our college there is no discrimination the caste system. We all are one family. High caste people, Dalit people are of one family. They live together, eat together and mingle with people. This thriving group of Matha schools are a beacon of hope for this underdeveloped region. Live to serve as our motto. We always live for the welfare of the other people, particularly the downtrodden people, the untouchable people, neglected people, oppressed, suppressed, depressed people. Young people once stuck in the mire of poverty are now doctors, nurses, therapists, mechanics, and engineers. They're leading fruitful, productive, often sacrificial lives. Jayakumar has received many accolades for his work among the poor. The schools have also received numerous awards on behalf of its students. Every year the enrollment increases, programs get better, and the schools create more partnerships for student placements. Jayakumar and Jayapakiyam are encouraged to see how students open their hearts to God. The school offers a Christ-centered learning environment that becomes rich soil for the seed of the gospel. God increased my knowledge in my profession as well as I got a good opportunity to uh, know more about Christ and uh, to taste His love more abundantly. Uh, really, it was a good opportunity. I really thank God and I when I joined in Madhav College, I thought I only joining for the industrial training. But when I started to attend the morning worship and the morning regular prayer, then I realized there is a God who can meet my needs. Then I realized a lot of things. Before I was aimless, when I regular to my worship and prayers, then I realized I must have aim in my life. One thing that's, that's very close to my heart is how do I reach the people of India Christ. And I think the place where we can have maximum impact would be in the area of education. Nearly 45% of Indians today are under the age of 18, which means that very few of them are going to be meeting Christ in a church setting. Though later the church has a major role to play, they are going to be most likely met at an educational institution. We need to focus on having Christ-centered education opportunities provided to these young Indians who are going to be the future. India has had the tremendous history of having Christian schools and Christian hospitals. Unfortunately, many of them are slowly dying out for different reasons. And, and we don't want to concede that ground. Education has become an industry. And so it's concentrated with all kinds of schools in the cities. But still, there's a huge population of young people in the rural areas where it's still a wide open door, a tremendous opportunity for Christians. I think they need to be supported in making it economically viable uh, to run these schools. For the most part, India's 40 million Christians have very little influence or support from the West. That's one of the reasons I believe it's important that we're here on the air to help support them with strong, biblical teaching. We also want to assist the national ministries in their efforts to address the many challenges they face day after day. When we get behind these projects in very practical ways, it not only helps the children, but also tells our brothers and sisters that we stand with them. This project is one that is very important to me because I know how education is a significant way to positively change a life. Jayakumar wants to expand the range of students he's reaching out to. They have purchased a field where the school can be built. Oh God, we thank you for this opportunity. You have blessed this place, God. You have blessed 
living truth ministry people go you bless the dr charles price and the members of the people's church you bless the canada people we thank you god to utilize this place for the caring the children home guide how to utilize this place how to plan this place for the purpose of the trampled and neglected students how to uh, run the project please guide us everything in your hand please help this god thank you amen his vision is to build a residential primary school for younger children so those who have no way of even completing their primary education will be able to attend one of the matter secondary and post secondary schools if your heart has been touched i encourage you to call or write to us today call the toll free number 1-888-269-6085 or log on to our website livingtruth.ca if you wish to send a check or money order you can address it to living truth PO box 6100 station B Toronto Ontario N2K 2Z5 you're watching a special edition of living truth on location in India coming up Jay Kumar and Jay Pakiam asked God to help them build a residential school. As they pray, a young girl waits. Every day when I stay behind, Lord, I remember and I wait. Do you see me wait? Three kilometers in India's rural outback can be a long way. That's the distance Dana walks every day to catch the bus that will take her into town. As she waits for the bus, she watches the women building the new shelter. She knows this could have been her life. Instead, she has the wonderful opportunity to do the very thing she loves the most. I've always loved children, and from my childhood, I wanted to study nursing and do something that would help children. Growing up in this small rural village was hard. All my life, I've seen my family work for daily wages. No one in my entire family has been educated in any way. I remember the day I learned that the Mata School was sponsoring some poor students. I applied, and they gave me a chance to study and go to college. That was the day Donna's life changed forever. Since graduating from nursing college, she works here in one of the Matha Mission Hospitals. I've told my patients who are in difficult times, some of them in a lot of pain, I console them by inviting them to pray to God, and He is listening, and He cares, and He can help them in ways I cannot. I'm so grateful to what Mr. Jay Kumar and Jay Pakhem have done. Without them, I would never have been able to go to school. I want to use the important opportunity I have been given. After her eight-hour shift in the hospital, as Donna travels back to her village, she looks forward to the happiest moment of her day, when she gets to return to the children in her village. Each day, she dedicates two to three hours to community education and nursing here. I'm the only nurse or medical personnel this whole village has. Because of the poverty, people suffer a lot medically. They cannot always get good food, so they're often ill. She prescribes medications for the children and advises people when they should go to the hospital. She also teaches the children. I teach them how to take proper care of their health, what nutritious food to eat, and how to maintain personal hygiene. She knows that teaching the children is an investment in the whole village. These children will go and educate their parents. By teaching them, I will educate the whole family. I'm not paid to do this, but I know it's important. I could be working in the big city, but this area is my home. I want to be close to the people that sponsored me, and I want to stay to help my own community and the children I love so much. This is my place. When Donna studied at the Matha College of Nursing, she learned about Jesus. She has a very personal relationship with him. I trust in him, and I'm so grateful that he granted my deepest desire to become a nurse. When Donna leaves her home each day, she knows she's not alone in her work. 
she has a partner who is as dedicated to her work as she is. I have someone with me every day. God is on my team. We work together. These stories tell us how great and kind God is. And to think that this great God teams up with us to be his hands to this world that he loves so much. We believe that the gospel is something that needs to impact all the parts of a person's life and through every stage of their life from its earliest beginnings to its final moments. Some building blocks like education are a very critical and foundational part of a person's life. Helping put these into poor children's lives in conjunction with the gospel is especially satisfying. The caste system here has put a label of untouchable on many of these children. And as a result, they've been treated like second or third or fourth class citizens, sometimes tragically even like animals. But our God is a God who doesn't make distinctions like that between people. He is no respecter of persons. Everyone is equal and everyone is loved in his sight. This is the good news that Jesus died for all because he loves all without distinction. That's what we're called to do as well, to love without distinction with the same spirit that Jesus exemplified and we want to give all the boys and girls, regardless of class or financial ability, the same opportunity for an education in a nurturing, caring, and Christian environment. I'd like to ask you to support this project. You can call 1-888-269-6085 to make a donation by credit card. That number again is 1-888-269-6085. Or you can log on to our website, livingtruth.ca, to pledge your support online. If you prefer, you can also send your check or money order to Living Truth, P.O. Box 6100, Station B, Toronto, Ontario, M2K 2Z5. Your gift will be tangible evidence of God's love for India's children. But it's more than that. It's also a message to the church here. It tells our brothers and sisters in India that Living Truth is a television program that not only hits the airwaves somewhere up there, but it also touches the ground, impacting the smallest child right here. We know it's not good enough to be up there in the air somewhere if we're not down here on the ground. And we're here because we've built relationships with many key people in this country who tell us how important it is that we're here. The message of Jesus is a life-changing message, and we need to see that uh, on TV. People need to hear it, need to be given an opportunity to experience it. India being illiterate con country, I think television and media will make a big difference. Through the media, through the television, television you can reach into many houses where you, we cannot go into their homes. Uh, there is lots of darkness in this country, as you know already. We have so many religions and uh, uh, people are bound totally. And unless they are set free by the truth of Jesus, there is no hope for this nation. Television, this is uh, now the... Uh, the 31st century, the people all watching TV, videos. So through this television, many people will turn to Jesus. It will be very good help. Even in the poor homes, in the rural India, uh, homes of India, TV is there. So where we cannot send workers, we are able to uh, send gospel through the media of television. This ministry is fantastic and God will bless this ministry in and around Calcutta and in the country in India as a whole. Spiritually, India is really open because in India has a lot of religious beliefs and they are open to, uh, you know, any teaching, but they need to know the truth and the truth is through the Bible and the Word of God. I have been praying for the Ministry of uh, Television here in India, asking the Lord, Lord, someone to you you know make use of it here in Calcutta and this is I feel it is an answer to my prayer also that you know the people's church have brought the living truth over here the, the program over here so I am very much delighted and I am thankful to God we're here in India literally halfway around the world from Canada in a culture that's so very different from our own in fact, almost everything here is different, but we're here because of what is the same the world over.
And that's what we experience as human beings. Whether we're Canadian or Indian, everywhere, loss causes sadness and grief, and love and affection are as warm and important to children here as they are to us back at home. You know, just this last week, I spent one day in Calcutta with street children, and the next day, I had the privilege of attending an opulent wedding in Chennai with 5,000 people. And the interesting thing is this. On the one hand, they were children with nothing, not even a home to live in. On the other, they were some of the aristocracy of the city of Chennai. But behind the skin of each of those people, they were exactly the same, in need of love, easy to be hurt, and with the desire to know and love God to find meaning and fulfillment in life. And that's why we've included some of the video journals and stories in these special programs. We think it's important to get to know some of India's people. Lord, every day I wait. I wait and I remember how much I wanted to stay in school, to study and to learn. I wanted to be a teacher, but I remember when I wasn't allowed to go anymore. I had to stay home to take care of my brother and sister. I was promised that I could return, but now it's been too long. Lord, I still wait. I still wait to go to school. Every day, Lord, I still wait. Every day when I work in my home, Lord, I still wait. Every day when I fetch water, I remember and I still wait. Every day when I wash the clothes, Lord, do you see me wait? Every day when I help make baskets, Lord, do you see me wait? Every day when I stay behind, Lord, I remember and I wait. Do you see me wait? You're watching a special edition of Living Truth on location in India. Coming up, the heartbreaking reality. Children without access to education. Children in rural areas face many challenges, especially in getting basic education. Our area, Sivahangai and Ramna district, is the most drought-prone uh, area in Tamil Nadu, India. Nearly 80% of the people in the rural area, they, they were unable to continue their study. Most of the region is comprised of small villages, the majority without schools. The closest school might be 20 or 30 kilometers away. Here in the villages, transportation is not what uh, uh, in the West. Most people walk for many miles even to get things like water. For a student to go to school, it would mean many miles of walking and not in simple conditions. I mean, they've got very hot weather, they've got the rainy monsoons, and so that would be enough disincentive for someone who's already being challenged in other ways to get an education. Getting people to attend regularly under such circumstances where they have to travel so many kilometers uh, is, is not very easy. That's why Jayakumar knows the importance of a school where the children can stay during the week. The idea of having a residential school definitely will ensure not only a community of people who are from the same caste, who once they've been able to liberate their minds, uh, you're actually forming a cohort of people who can do a lot of things for their own community later. Jayakumar has arranged temporary housing for 100 boys and girls. We have uh, one building that is the uh, building actual purpose to develop college of teacher education this first floor we utilize uh, the time being in future uh, we will develop a whole hostel for the caring the children home we will provide loving caring and christian environment for the children we give accommodation food dress and uh, everything we will supply for the children I feel I am like a father. But for Jayakumar, being a father means the children will receive more than just physical care and nurture. Like the schools with older young men and women, they will participate in morning devotions, Bible studies, prayer, and worship. 
during the curriculum we will plan to teach the gospel to the poor students and we motivate the students all the students live in the way of jesus christ sacrifice their life to the downtrodden poor Jaya Kumar is pleased that the infrastructure to help the young children continue their education is already in place. We support some students up to higher education. After completed the higher education, all the students will get the chance to study our college, nursing college, physiotherapy college, teacher training institute and the arts college. And it doesn't end there. Like a true loving father, Jayakumar has a long-range plan in sight for those he calls his children. After complete their professional studies, we will arrange employment opportunity. At the time, the students also will support to for the home for the poor students. Jayakumar's story reminds me of Isaac and Tara, who many of you met last week, and the work that God has laid on their hearts. They're starting a home for children and a Christian adoption agency, rescuing children like Jay Kumar, also once an orphan. His story is such a wonderful example of what can happen when we open our hearts and lives to a little helpless child. Now Jay Kumar impacts his country and the lives of so many others for such good. Your gift is a response to the commandment to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, and to care for the sick. But it's more than that. Giving is an opportunity to broaden your borders, allowing God to use you to share His light with the world. You can't change the entire world, but you can change the life of this child, or this one, or this one. There's once a small boy walking along a beach with his father. An unusually high tide had brought in lots of starfish and left them on the beach where they were drying out and likely were going to die. This little boy began to pick up the starfish and throw it back into the sea. Then another throw it back in, then another, throw it back in. His father turned and said, son, there's far too many for that to make any difference. And as the little boy threw the next starfish into the water, he said, dad, it'll make a difference for this one. For this child, your gift will make a difference. If that's something you want to do, I encourage you to call in today. You can make a donation by calling, logging on to our website, or sending a check through the mail. To make a donation with your credit card, call the toll-free number 1-888-269-6085. Or log on to our website, livingtruth.ca. If you wish, you can send a check or money order. You can address it to Living Truth, P.O. Box 6100, Station B, Toronto, Ontario, M2K 2Z5. Like Canada, India is a remarkable synthesis of races, cultures, and religions striving to live together. With three times the population of the United States living in one third of the space, it is home to almost half of the entire world's people groups. Not much variety means more languages and dialects than anyone seems to be able to count. The Indian Constitution has managed to recognize 22 of them officially. And we think that we have trouble with French and English. Interestingly, India has the second largest number of English-speaking people in the world. 150 million in all. Now that's a significant potential audience for living truth. What a joy it is to greet you through this wonderful program. It gives me immense pleasure to welcome Living Truth to India. My friends, I'm so glad that Living Truth is coming to India. We're really happy to know that Living Truth is interested to come to Chennai, to India. We'd like to welcome Dr. Charles Price to the church in India. And we definitely need Living Truth to come in and help us. We are welcoming with waiting arms for the Living Truth to come into our country. I'm so happy to invite a Living Truth Ministries in India. I welcome this Living Truth to India. God bless you. This is my joy and privilege to say we are delighted and grateful for Pastor Charles Price being seen and heard in India. You see, with over a billion people, 
and 40% of the people speaking English. What a blessing it is going to be to have millions of people receive this teaching. For me, knowing Pastor Charles, his life and his commitment to scripture, I am convinced this is going to be a significant thing for the kingdom of God and for the subcontinent. Of late, we have had a lot of globalization taking place. Indians are traveling abroad, and our youth, I believe, are at a quandary. They don't know whether they should cling to their old traditions or accept newer mindset, newer values. So I believe we are welcoming with waiting arms for the living truth to come into our country. Uh, being a minority in a country, facing severe odds, facing the fact that you may lose your job tomorrow because the conversion into a Christian is something very formidable and very rarely people will venture to do this. It is very essential that the ministry comes and tells them how to take the step forward. We definitely need to help and preserve the identities of these Christians. The Living Truth television media is a need in India for the young, for the leaders, and for the people who are looking for something new, they are in need of this channel. I think the need of the hour is for a clear, simple teaching of God's Word. And that's why when I heard of Dr. Charles Price, I had been praying just very recently that there will be someone who will air such a program on a television channel here in India. Yes, I think the spiritual life in India is very open now, especially among the young people. They're looking for something that is going to give them encouragement in their struggles. And as they develop their own uh, intellectual abilities, they, they're looking for a hope for their future life. I'm sure that will be greatly appreciated by the Christian community in India and also so many secret Christians who are in India because people are people have a great longing to hear the word of God. What a joy, what a thrill it is to know that the great people's church in Toronto is coming all the way to the great nation of India with the good news of God's love and compassion. I'm sure that living truth is going to be a great blessing for the millions of people, seekers in India. special edition of Living Truth on location in India. For the past few weeks, we've been focusing on the children. We've heard many stories and our hearts have been touched, but we couldn't leave this country without letting you know about another group of people equally in need and equally vulnerable. Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you? or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Sometimes the sheer numbers are overwhelming. They can get in the way of connecting to the reality. But there are many boys and girls, too many, who know firsthand what it is like. They know that poverty has a smell, it has a look, it has a face, it has a feeling. For this little boy, sold as a bonded slave, life holds no promise of any kind. Every day is the same. Bricks into the oven, bricks out of the oven. More bricks out of the oven, and again. Piled here, piled there. Day after endless day, season after season, and year after year. As he comes down the street, his life will continue like this. He thinks about school and wonders what it would be like. He'll never know. He prays that one day, he'll have the opportunities other children have. In the meantime, he continues to take bricks out of the oven, day after day after day. I know as I see the faces of these children, I'm reminded of my own children and how dear they are to me and how I'd do almost anything for them. These boys and girls are in their formative years. We're just now beginning to understand how that what happens in a child's early years is directly connected to their ability to fully develop when they grow up. These are critical years. 
And I think it's fair to say that without help, the full healthy development of these children will be arrested or distorted. They need someone to step in and help make that critical difference now. When we help the destitute and those who the world has forgotten, whether it's children or the aged who are too feeble to fend for themselves, we're being God's hands and God's heart to this hurting world. The fact is, words without actions are meaningless. Our actions here today, reaching out to make a difference in these people's lives, brings the gospel of Jesus Christ to life for them. Now that's an exciting proposition. Maybe you personally will never come here to this land to be able to alleviate the suffering of these dear folks or to tutor a child with their math or their spelling. But you can help someone else do that. God has given each of us gifts and strengths to do our part. What gift do you have? God asks each of us to be responsible for the gifts he's given. And each of us plays a unique and unrepeatable part in God's redemptive plan. Here's my question. What can you and only you do? If you can't go, will you support those who are already here? Every day, God gives us opportunities to work with Him in fulfilling His purposes. Our job is to pay attention to Him and to respond when we hear God speak. Have you heard Him speak to you today? Have you discovered the joy that comes from being responsive to Him? Friends, there's a great adventure waiting for you when you live to give. And you can do that from wherever you are. You can call us or log into the website or write to us today. You can call 1-888-269-6085 to make a donation by credit card. That number again is 1-888-269-6085. Or you can log on to our website, livingtruth.ca, to pledge your support online. Over these past three weeks in India, we haven't addressed the root causes of the poverty and social injustice, which are many and complex. At this moment, dealing with these deep-rooted and systemic problems is not what we're able to do. But we pray for those who do work to make a difference in the political, economic, and social arenas. We know that we have been called to give evidence for the love of God and to serve those who suffer. What we're doing is what we are able to do right now. We're starting here. We're starting with the measure we've been given. And we want to be faithful, knowing that God will bless these efforts. I hope you've been able to be with us for this entire program this past hour. Our journey has been very exciting, and we've been touched by the people we've met. Each gift you've given does make a difference. It's God's work to multiply what we give to Him. When we give what we can, the Lord will produce the fruit of that. Being responsive to God makes a significant contribution to the lives of the children and the adults that we're investing in, that you've heard about. But it's also a gift you give back to yourself. Did you know that? Because when you look beyond yourself to the needs of others, you release yourself from the hold of material things. You can discover the joy of giving. I want to thank every one of you that has already responded to one of these special broadcasts. From the bottom of my heart, I thank you. It's hard to think of something that is more satisfying for me to do than to be here representing you and to help keep living truth on the air in India and partnering with the projects and people that you've seen in these three programs. We're working with some of the finest, the most loving, the most giving and godly people I think I've ever met. I'm happy to team with them in this work. We also want to extend thanks from one more group, those who do not have a voice of their own. On behalf of the children whose lives have been impacted by your love, I thank you. God bless you. How deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure.